Imagine yourself in a school where you're asked to be dressed from head to toe, and you're not allowed to step out of your dorm after 6.30 p.m. <laughs> Men in the audience, you are absolutely fine. You can go and work in your library and even work in your workshop spaces till midnight or even 24-7. But women out there, dare you step out. This is all being done for you in the name of safety. And not abiding by this would mean that you're asking for it and probably an immediate suspension from the school. This is exactly how my undergraduate school life is. However, since I wanted to build things and really do hands-on engineering, I decided to break these laws. I did skip meals. I did sneak out. I did everything wrong because I wanted to study and sometimes even hide under that desk when gas came patrolling and looking for me. I can't forget that day when my mother called me crying after a phone call from my director's office. They were probably planning to throw me out of the institution. My mother was very upset. She asked me a bunch of questions. Why can't you behave like a normal girl? Why do you have to go out and really work 24-7? And these labs, what do you think? They're going to protect you if you get sexually abused at night? What are you going to do? I didn't have answers to all of the questions then. So I kept quiet, but deep inside, I knew that I am not going to stop. <laughs> Months later, the Nirbhaya gang rape case happened in New Delhi, December 16, 2012. The barbaric incident brought the entire country on streets. People marched holding candles, asking for justice, asking for a change. But there, in one corner of my room, I was sitting all by myself, asking how I could contribute, how I could intervene as a woman, as an engineer, and as a victim. Yes, as a victim of sexual assault myself, I decided I wanted to take a different route. Years later, at MIT, as a graduate student, we started looking at how technologically we could intervene in the space of sexual abuse. And we decided a bunch of areas through education, through direct detection, communication, and prevention methodologies. At MIT, when we were going through all of this, we realized that as a community, we have a great system set up in the preventive space. We go and do everything possible to prevent sexual abuse. And we try to dictate a person's life in every possible way, from the way they dress up to the way they walk to the way they talk. And if that even helps, we can even go down to disfiguring their body so that they don't look sexually attractive. <sighs> and on the other hand, we also have a great system, which is truly great in itself. And I'm not using sarcasm here, which tries to help a victim when they have been abused and they're looking for help. We have a lot of centers which try to help a person emotionally, physically, and mentally to get out of the trauma. But there's a gray area between this setup and that setup. They'd probably look very close to each other, but there's a time gap. From the moment where a person is sexually abused to the time when they actually start talking about it and asking for help, this time gap is directly dependent on where they come from or what kind of torture they have been going through. It probably could be hierarchical, because nowadays we have a lot happening at workspaces, right? <laughs> but this can also be physical or emotional. And when we started looking at this time gap, we realized that it is directly related to also another factor, geographic location. Imagine if you're from any of these 37 highlighted states, you can probably be a victim of marital rape and ask for justice. But just think, if you're not amongst those, and you're in the other 13, or you come from a country like India, where marital rape is not even recognized in the law books. It's pretty shocking, <laughs> yes. 
And as we started going through this, I was very keen to even just educate people around this space, which we as people need. So we looked at a speculative design project. I really hated when people told me to wear clothes one top on top of each other just to prove that I'm not asking for it. So we did this project at MIT with my colleagues. This project is called as the cultural lens. You can see the guy in this picture over here. He thinks that I am dressed inappropriately. And since he can't control, he wears on this lens over his eyes so that he can prove that he's disciplined. But on the other hand, I don't have to wear uh, layers of clothing just to prove that I'm not asking for it. We wanted to go a step further in that direction and really look for technological inventions or interventions which can prevent rape in the real time. And while we were trying to do that, we looked for inspiration from nature. And guess what we found? A skunk. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to make you people smell really bad. So skunk uses odor as a way to de predators in real time. And we were quite fascinated that odor could actually do that. So we looked at literature which could actually define the relationship between odor and how it helps in like sexual arousal and those kind of things. And we found a lot of correlations in that space. But we found something very interesting, which is a paper from Science which talks about how the scent of a teardrop can make men less arousing. And it can already turn off their arousal rate. So we, we got some cues from this paper. And since we were looking at college campus sexual assault at that point, which is mostly caused because of sexual attraction at the first place, we thought it would be a great intervention. So we got an IRB approved, got a lot of people in our lab, made them smell different kind of odors while they were being sexually stimulated. And we came across with a palette which can actually do that. So we made all of these in the form of accessories, and now in a laboratory setup, we can actually demonstrate that smells could be used for reducing the libido effect within few seconds. As a victim of sexual abuse in both academic and public spaces, I do understand what it takes for a victim to speak up. And I also understand what help means. From the time a person is sexually abused to the actual help they get, there's a time gap. And we wanted to work on early detection, early communication, and documentation processes. So we came up with an interesting wearable on body, which is like a sticker. It sticks to your fabric and detects difference between how you remove your clothing versus if somebody else is trying to remove your clothing. It takes that mapping and tries to inform you and ask you if the act is done with consent. And imagine if a person is incapacitated or is not in a situation to fight against the assaulter, especially in cases like child sexual abuse. We would need technologies or interventions which can actually communicate it to the people who actually can come for help. So this technology, once it reconfirms with the user, and there's no response found in the, in the respective time frame, it starts buzzing a loud alarm and asks for help from those predefined five people by the user. It also sends the information about the location of the person. And if required, it also calls one of the most trusted member in the list. And they can hear everything about what's going on in the background and it also records it to make sure that if you're going for a legal proceeding future, in future, you can always get back to this and you can document it and you can go ahead with the process. This device also has a self-actuation button which can be pressed by the victim in case they are conscious and they can understand an approaching threat towards them. I know that I needed one of these devices when I was being sexually abused in that dark night at 2 a.m. in my lab, when my mentor was trying to force himself on me. And I know that all those victims who are being abused every 98 seconds in this country 
are not asking for it as I wasn't asking for it that day. Today, as a young woman, as a survivor of sexual abuse, and a woman who wants to be a future mom, I really want to share my concerns with you. I don't want to force my child into a fearful future, but I'm concerned. I don't want to clip my child's wings and dictate my child's life in every possible way as it was done to me. Today, I stand before you not as an individual, but as the face of those invisible victims who would never get justice, as the voice of those disabled victims and children who won't ever be able to express what they're going through, and as the body of those who have suffered innumerable scars and go through the same trauma every day they think about that particular incident. And for all those parents, millions of those parents who fear about their child's safety every now and then. I know we are hundreds, thousands, and millions of us. I urge to this crowd today to make the unsafe safe, the unarmed empowered, so that we can come together and build a better future for our children, for our loved ones so that we can raise our children the way they want to. And I know that we all can do this together in whatever capacity we are, in whatever position we are, because every voice against sexual abuse matters. Thank you.